Professor Hart's latest book, Drug Use for Grown-Ups, has changed the national conversation on responsible drug use. He'll tell us more about myths and facts about cannabis and psychosis. From the Columbia University in New York City, please welcome Professor Carl Leroy Hart. Bom dia. Uh, that, that's, this, that's the extent of my Portuguese, I'm sorry. Um, but thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, I wish I could speak Portuguese better and be more confident to give this talk in Portuguese. But, and so as a result of not speaking Portuguese, I will make sure I speak as slowly as possible. Um, so uh, hopefully you can understand every word I'm saying. Um, OK. Are my slides coming up now? Right on. Thank you. Um, I was asked to speak about cannabis and psychosis, uh, which is a really narrow topic for me, uh, but I know the conference is focused on uh, cannabis and, and, and medicine, and, and that's fine. Uh, it's just that uh, uh, I get bored sometimes when I'm asked to speak about narrow topics, and so I might wander a little bit, so please forgive me. Um, the agenda is simple. I'm going to give uh, a, a brief history of why and how cannabis became illegal in the U.S. And I, I say the U.S. in part because when things become like drugs become illegal in the U.S., uh, it has this sort of, it reverberates around the world uh, in part because there is a lot of money in prohibition. And so the U.S. exports its awful drug policy around the globe. Uh, and so I'm going to say something about the U.S.'s uh, drug policy. And I'm going to talk about what we know primarily about this link between cannabis and psychosis. And then I'm going to have a few suggestions for future research. Um, so if you will, please come back with me till 1914. In 1914 in the U.S., we passed our first federal laws restricting drugs. This first law was called the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act. It was actually a tax law. It just simply uh, said that people who dealt, who used, and manufactured opioids and cocaine had to register with the federal government and pay a tax. Uh, and then they get a stamp to show that they paid this tax, uh, and then they'd be legal. The tax was, at the time, something some very low cost, like a dollar. Um, and the goal was not to ban opioids and cocaine, but the goal was to make people register. So there's an accounting kind of thing. Uh, then in 1920, in the United States, we uh, passed um, uh, alcohol prohibition. We prohibited alcohol. Uh, I didn't say uh, with the Harrison Act, uh, in order to get the Harrison Act to be passed, because it was the first time uh, that we passed a national drug law, and in, at, in the 19 uh, uh, teens, the country was not in any mood to ban uh, substances at a national level because uh, there was this strong sort of state's rights. We didn't want, each state didn't want the federal government to tell them what to do. You might see this today with the pandemic where we have people in the country that didn't want to wear masks. Uh, a number of, so, or you might see this with guns in the United States. There are states that don't want you to take away their guns. And so that's that was the atmosphere in 1914 uh, when they tried to pass the Harrison Act, but it passed, and it passed in part because of our good old American racism. And so we made the population afraid, uh, telling them that it, uh, black and uh, uh, Chinese people were using cocaine and opioids, and so therefore, we must regulate these things in order to make sure those people don't get out of control. That was successful. Fast forward to 1920, 
we uh, banned alcohol, in part because of our dislike of Germans, uh, who were big in the alcohol industry at that time in the United States. Uh, and so alcohol prohibition passed. Alcohol prohibition passes, the people who are responsible for, for enforcing the law uh, is the Bureau of Narcotics. Uh, the Bureau of Narcotics are also responsible for the Harris enforcing the Harrison Act. Prohibition is an act that is uh, done to prohibit the use of alcohol. And so now the same officers are now enforcing the Harrison Act in order to um, prohibit the use of these substances. 1933, alcohol prohibition was re repealed, reversed. Uh, and, and so now you have these officers who um, you build up this agency, the, Nas the, the Bureau of Narcotics, now alcohol prohibition re repealed. They don't have anything to do, these officers. And the country's in the middle of an economic depression. So at the time, this guy, Harry Anslinger, was the head of the Bureau of Narcotics. He was the son-in-law of uh, Andrew Mellon, who was the Secretary of Treasury, the money guy in the United States. Um, uh, Anslinger was 38 years old when he took over this role, and he was in that role of the Bureau of Narcotics for 30 years. His agency has nothing to do, and it's losing staff. And so now, the agency has to have a new enemy. Cannabis becomes the new enemy. Uh, one of the things that his agency did uh, was to exaggerate the claims, negative claims, about cannabis. So Harry, Harry Anslinger said the, that marijuana is the most uh, violent causing drug in the history of mankind. And these sorts of things, uh, this kind of propaganda was promulgated uh, widely at that time. And he also connected cannabis use with black people and Mexican Americans at the time, two groups that were uh, despised, marginalized groups in the country. Uh, you might know the cult classic called Reefer Madness. Uh, this film is a film that uh, um, basically says that you take cannabis once, you'll be doing heroin soon, or, and you'll go crazy and kill your parent. And, but this is just a small clip of the kind of propaganda that was pervasive in the early 1930s and that was supported, funded by the Bureau of Narcotics. I see no reason why the request should not be granted. So this type of propaganda was uh, popular in the early 1930s in the United States, and it played an important role in 
passing this thing we call the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. When Congress was hearing or having discussions about whether or not the drug should be banned, um, there were a number of people, including from the medical community, uh, that testified about these exaggerated claims, claiming that you smoke cannabis, then you lose your mind like you saw in the film, uh, and then you are violent and uncontrollable. So it's not surprising that the law was passed, uh, and in 1937, October, it took effect. And the goal was to eliminate cannabis use. Unlike, unlike the Harrison Act, the goal here was to eliminate it. Now, it's important for us to know uh, some themes as we move forward, because as we think about cannabis and what we're learning about cannabis and what we know now, it's important for us to apply that to other drugs as well. Uh, so when we think about cannabis, the cannabis was banned, and not for scientific reason, but because of economic and social reason. So uh, the Bureau of Narcotics banning of cannabis really gave them a uh, reason for being. It helped uh, their agency continue people's employment. And this is uh, one of the sort of major points or reasons for the war on drugs. It's a jobs program, but it's hard to help people to understand that if you are not uh, observing what's happening with a number of drugs. So it's an important thing to, to understand, and also for uh, social reasons like racism. 1944, uh, the mayor of New York, LaGuardia, uh, issued a major report where it, he had a major study of cannabis. and concluded that individuals who had been smoking marijuana for a period of years showed no mental or physical deterioration which could be attributed to the drug. This was a comprehensive study and frankly those findings hold up today. But it was too late. The law had been passed, the damage had been done, and at the federal level marijuana was banned and it currently remains banned today in the United States. Um, at the federal level. I know it's kind of confusing for some people because when you look at what's happening at the state levels, you, uh, there are 38 states in Washington, D.C. that allow for medical marijuana. Uh, that is, people can receive uh, cannabis for some conditions. And then if you also look at the states, uh, uh, starting in 2012, we now have 19 states that allow for recreational use of the drug. So it's, it might be a bit confusing, uh, but at the federal le level, it remains banned. Uh, and federal law supersedes uh, state law. So the federal government can come in at any moment, even in those legal states. So uh, it's, it, 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 it may be confusing to some people, but uh, it allows us to again, continue um, our racism uh, in that we have a law, it's on the books, if we want to enforce it for some people, we will, but for other people, we won't. So it allows us to uh, be hypocritical. Um, so the question for me in, in, in this instance is, uh, what's changed? What's the driving force for these sort of changes in terms of cannabis, Regulation. Did we learn anything new in science? Not really. Uh, what's changed really is attitudes in the United States. You can see in this graph, it just shows the percentage of adults who say that cannabis should be legally available recreationally. It's increased to over 60% now, uh, way down from about 20, uh, 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 30, 40 years ago. Um, so uh, there are a number of people in the country who also think that locking people up for cannabis violations uh, is too harsh. And then what well, the major reason things have changed is because of the economic opportunities. There is a lot of money that can be made uh, with legal cannabis. And, and there are a number of big, uh, big corporations and people who are getting in that business. That's the major reason. And they have power uh, in, uh, with uh, U.S. politicians in terms of 
uh, donating money to their campaigns, lobbying these folks, and that's the real reason. There is, there's not, it's not really a science, and nothing's really changed in terms of the science. It's really these economic reasons that is, is driving this. But we still have our problems, even today, when, it, when we think about racial discrimination and arrest, we're still arresting in the country every year more than 500,000 people for simply possessing cannabis. Uh, so we're still doing that sort of stuff in a place like New York State. 90% uh, of the people who are being arrested for cannabis are black and brown. Same old situation. And now we're here, we also have this issue of uh, cannabis, whether or not cannabis causes uh, uh, psychosis. And, and this issue continues to persist. Uh, if you look at the scientific literature, there are, uh, before well, in the 1990s, there used to be about 10 papers a year that focused on this issue. After 2012, it skyrocketed to the over 100 paper a year, papers a year that focuses on this issue. And oftentimes, people uh, present summaries of the literature or some study, and, and we're going to talk about uh, that here in a second, but I, I just want to I want to just say, when I talk about psychosis or psychotic disorder, I want to be clear so everybody understands what I'm talking about. When I talk about a psychotic disorder, I, I mean a mental disorder that involves loss of contact with reality and is characterized by hallucinations, irrational uh, beliefs, and disorganized speech and behavior. And, and this sort of psychotic disorder has to be diagnosed by a clinician, a social worker, a physician, psychologist, uh, and I, and I want to separate that from things that we call psychotic symptoms, because psychotic symptoms are typically just brief, and they're not a disorder that causes a person to be impaired and disrupts their behavior. Um, so things that we know uh, about psychotic disorder in the general population uh, about 3% of individuals will experience uh, a psychotic disorder in their lifetime. Similarly, when we think about cannabis users, uh, it's uh, the percentage who will, who will experience a psychotic disorder is about 3% um, uh, as well. It's uh, uh, relatively low, but it's important for us to know it, note it. Um, it's also important for us to note that the majority of cannabis users, more than 95%, will never receive a diagnosis of, of psychotic disorder. Um, with, that same, in that, with that same sort of thinking, it's important for us to understand, too, when you compare it to something like tobacco, the majority of tobacco smokers won't develop cancer, but we're still concerned about cancer, 90% uh, or so uh, won't develop cancer, uh, but still there is this sort of uh, uh, risk uh, that's 10 times that for people who smoke versus people who don't smoke. So it's important to pay attention to that. When we compare that with something like cannabis, the risk is about two to one, and it can go as high as four to one. So it's four times uh, in people who uh, start early, start smoking, say, before age 15, and are heavy smokers. Uh, so it goes up to about, uh, you're, they're about four times more likely to uh, be diagnosed with a, a psychotic disorder. But again, it's still lower than the 10 times likely for tobacco smoke. But it's still important for us to understand uh, that that's, that's uh, uh, some evidence that's been uh, gotten pretty consistently. Um, uh, uh, we, wanna, we want people to also understand that people who are diagnosed with psychosis are more likely to report uh, current or prior cannabis use uh, compared with the general population. Uh, but it's also and equally important for people to understand that cannabis use does not occur in a vacuum. There are a number of things that, are, that can be going on in a person's life and are going on in the person's life that are difficult to disentangle from cannabis use alone. So we can think about uh, alcohol use, we can think about early sexual behavior in young kids, uh, poor school performance, we can think about um, 
a wide range of, of, of other deviant behaviors, truancy, lying, fighting, a wide range of things. And then when we think about psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, um, it's been linked or correlated with a number of things as well, like uh, family history of schizophrenia, uh, exposure to toxins, infections, um, uh, older age of the father, uh, birth month, a number of other correlations. So all of these things are important to think about when we're interpreting the findings in the literature. Uh, now, just briefly here, this, this is uh, an example of one of the papers in the literature that um, says that cannabis causes uh, a psychotic disorder. Now, uh, again, all of those sort of caveats come to play here. Uh, in this particular study, they uh, review uh, 13 studies, and 10 of the 13 uh, find a statistically significant uh, correlation between uh, what they're calling psychosis or a psychotic disorder and cannabis use. It's important to note when, when we're thinking about this literature that uh, uh, psychosis and, uh, or psychotic disorder and psychosis symptom or psychotic symptoms are being conflated. So some of these studies actually made a diagnosis whereas other studies only looked at symptoms. I'll look, explain that more clearly uh, in a second. But, but they're treated as if they are the same thing, and they are not the same thing. And so that's important for us to look at, what we'll, uh, that's important for us to think about when we're looking at the literature. This is just uh, uh, briefly how some of these studies are done. Thousands of adults are separated into groups of cannabis users versus non-cannabis users. And then the level of psychotic uh, disorder or psychosis is assessed or determined. Some of the studies actually do a diagnosis, as I pointed out, and others do not. They simply use like a 20-item questionnaire, and they contain questions like, I hear voices that others do not. That's important to think of when we think about uh, psychosis. Um, and it also contains other questions that are not so relevant when, when you, uh, like a question like, I sometimes feel uncomfortable in public. Uh, that could be related to psychosis or not. Like right now, I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> is that psychosis? Uh, so you, you understand what I'm saying. This is just one of those studies and a list of these questions. Um, so the three points that I, I want you guys to uh, think about is that the studies themselves, they, they, they can vary widely and they measure different constructs. And so it's important when you're reading the literature to see whether or not the paper actually looked at a psychotic disorder or they simply looked at psychotic symptoms thinks that they're calling psychotic symptoms. So uh, it's important information to have, and then you'll have a fuller picture of what's, what's going on. Uh, because it's important for people to understand that a person can endorse psychotic, uh, psychotic symptoms without meeting criteria for psychotic disorder. And the psychotic symptoms uh, are typically transient and not uh, behavior impairing. Um, and also important to know that it is really difficult to do the, prop, the, the sort of ideal study. Uh, and so as a result, we are left with observational and correlational studies. And so we haven't had a study that actually demonstrated a causal link. And so, but, but, but that's okay. We, we do the best we can by try, trying to have a wide range of studies uh, or diverse studies that come to some convergence, and, and that increases our confidence in the findings. But we have to understand and be aware of that potential limitation. If we are not, then we are more likely to make uh, inappropriate conclusions or draw inappropriate conclusions about what the actual evidence says. And so we recently uh, published a review, maybe five years ago, my colleague Charlie Kassir and I, 
and um, we came to some conclusions about this literature. Um, uh, we, there was no evidence demonstrating that cannabis itself causes a psychotic disorder, but both early and heavy use of cannabis, uh, more likely in individuals who are vulnerable to uh, uh, have, having a psychotic disorder. Um, again, a correlation has been found, as I pointed out before, but it's important for us to understand that this correlation is not specific to cannabis. Uh, there's correlation between the psychosis and anxiety. When we think about uh, cannabis-related effects, particularly in inexperienced users, uh, you can see some anxiety that rises to the level of paranoia when people smoke large doses and they are inexperienced. So that's not surprising when you, uh, when you think about the effects of cannabis, but those sort of effects should be transient. Um, uh, but you can also, uh, we also found that uh, uh, but uh, the, the psychosis correlates with other disorders, including mood disorders, bipolar um, uh, as well. And we also found that psychosis is correlated with heavy tobacco smoking, uh, like uh, with cannabis uh, is also uh, correlated with heavy alcohol use. Um, also with sedative use. So you can find the similar correlations with other substances. Uh, and so it's important for us to really try to disentangle and figure out what's going on. But at this stage, it's really difficult to draw causal, causal conclusions. And I just wanna uh, uh, remind people that uh, if you look at the, the schizophrenia literature or uh, psychotic disorder literature, looking for things that correlate with uh, psychosis or psychotic disorder, uh, there are, um, there's a series of studies looking at cat ownership in childhood as a risk factor for schizophrenia or psychotic disorder later in life. And this correlates as well. Uh, it, has, uh, it has similar risk uh, ratios as cannabis and so, um, uh, uh, it, so it's, it's, it's just reminds us to uh, uh, tread lightly and uh, when we are drawing uh, the causal connections. Um, and I just want to leave you with uh, the take home message of studies that examine whether certain patterns of substance use and other problem behaviors, uh, they are more likely to be more fruitful in helping us to understand uh, this sort of uh, link between psychosis and uh, 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 substance use or substance itself. But studies that exclusively focus on this cannabis psychosis connection or association, they won't be as helpful because uh, these things are not happening in a vacuum. Uh, so that is if a uh, if a child begins using cannabis at 14, at an early stage in life, on a regular basis heavily, there are a number of other things that are going on in that child's life that are inappropriate and that need some attention. But if you only focus on cannabis, then you probably are missing the bigger picture of what's happening with that child in that child's life. And with that, I wanna thank you for your time. And I think we will have some questions or. Thank you so much, what a great talk. And yes, now we will have time for questions. I will kindly ask you to raise your hand if you have a question, please be brief. Uh, it's questions, not lectures. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the timing needs to be count. And Professor will have Pleasure to answer. I see one end right over there. Is that is it the microphone there? Yes, yes. Uh, it's coming. Just a second. So if someone else has a question and raises the end, we can now start to see. Okay, one, two. So having cats is dangerous. Cat ownership. <laughs> Cat ownership. So the first question is right over there on the right. The gentleman 
wearing a black shirt. Thank you. Maybe we can have some light in the audience. Uh, thank you, Carl. It was a, a very nice lecture and eye opener. Um, I'm a researcher, and uh, uh, I also uh, would like you to elaborate on cannabis use. Uh, what do you mean by cannabis? Because uh, if you smoke regular cannabis, as you know, its uh, THC content grew since the 60s uh, until now. Uh, it's, I think it's still fine and I agree with you. But uh, we can also include here skunk. And uh, statistics say that uh, in London, 25% uh, of new psychosis cases are surely linked with uh, skunk, which has already like 30% uh, of THC. And finally, uh, as you know, THC is only a, a, a partial agonist for the CB receptor. But uh, you can buy synthetic cannabinoids, you know, under the name of bath salts and so on. And uh, in Portugal, uh, every day, one, two, one or two uh, child children are hospitalized because of uh, these uh, unknown substances, you know, normally coming from China. Uh, and uh, those are also considered technically cannabis uh, constituents, but they really provoke psychosis. This was my first question, and uh, the That's very your first question. <laughs> sorry, and and the very very. Uh, uh, you have another one. Other question. I'm sorry. How much of your funds, uh, research funds, are coming from big pharma? Those that uh, pro those pharma that produce cannabis or medical cannabis, because this is something I I. Uh, understand there's a problem that big pharma don't really see the opportunity of uh, sharing some of their uh, uh, I mean income or even some of the taxes paid by big pharma should be uh, directed into research. This is something I think uh, should be changed by politicians. This is, these are my two questions. So these are the two questions, right? Sorry. Thank you so much. All right. Um, uh, the first one, I just want to make sure I understand it. I think you were making the argument that um, high THC concentration cigarettes are more problematic, um, and it, particularly for psychosis. And uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a law of pharmacology. So if you think about uh, people taking larger doses of any drug, particularly if they're inexperienced, whereas experienced cannabis users, it's not as much of an issue. Uh, think about amphetamines, the same sort of thing, a number of drugs. So yeah, younger people who take, who stupidly take large doses of THC without any experience, um, uh, that's not good. You, you, can, you increase the likelihood of having extreme anxiety, paranoia, uh, and other problems. And so you want people to take it slow. I, I didn't talk about that in this talk. Uh, there are some basic sort of principles, uh, dose, route of administration, set, I mean the setting where drug use is being taken, where it's being taken. All of those things can uh, minimize or attenuate some of these negative effects. So it's important for people to attend to that. Uh, so you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, 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 that's the advice we give people. Uh, and your second uh, uh, question was related to how much funding do I get from Big Pharma? Big Pharma? <laughs> was that it? <laughs> yeah. No, that's a great question. No, uh, so any funding that I've gotten has come from the U.S.'s National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, but people don't ask about their bias because they are biased too. Mm -hmm in making sure we highlight the negative effects of drugs. And so um, uh, that's where most of my funding has come from. And I was on their uh, uh, advisory board as well. And, 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 and so uh, I, didn't, I don't get any money from Big Pharma. Huh? I think we have to move to another question.
Maybe and we can you, talk afterwards. You will have time on your coffee break for sure. It will be after. So we have someone in the front, yes, already with a microphone. If uh, Yes, I saw right there, but you're... You have microphone, yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for coming here all the way from the States. We appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, everything you said. And uh, I'm living in, in Geneva, between Geneva and the States, so it's not that far. Uh, not many people can live in the States these days, as you may know. You lucky man. Anyway, so um, look, uh, my question is not super grounded in science, but uh, this plant is not super grounded in science. So this plant has been in traditional use for thousands of years by sh uh, shamans as well, uh, shamanic people. Uh, natural tribes and uh, it's been used for spiritual reasons there's now recent discoveries in Israel 2,000 years ago it was used in Judea in uh, Jewish ritual um, you ask yourself I mean psychotic symptoms is kind of parallel to spiritual awakening so maybe this is a property of the plant maybe it's part of its traditional use maybe we're using it in the wrong context maybe some people shouldn't be using it in that context maybe it caused them to suddenly speak to God and were the biblical prophets psychotic I don't know uh, great question thank uh, you Great point. Um, uh, the question relates to just the effects of the compound itself, the sort of expected effects or the, the desired effects for some people. Some people would like to be that altered, uh, and they expect that, and that's what they're seeking. Uh, and so you might just simply have, you have also had this sort of selection uh, bias, if you will, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, those effects. In fact, that's, a, that's the desired effect for some people. You're absolutely right. Uh, that's one, that's, uh, uh, when we think about drug effects, and then we're thinking about who are interpreting the effects. We can even think about uh, what we deem as psychotic disorders and the way we look at that. Um, there are multiple ways to look at it. And so I absolutely agree with you. That I, I absolutely agree with you. We have to be careful uh, when we're uh, drawing or these interpretations or drawing these conclusions and making these interpretations. Um, uh, you're absolutely right. So within this presentation, I tried to be as careful as possible so people could understand that uh, uh, there are multiple ways to look at this. And uh, we have no direct causal link to a psychotic disorder. So I tried to explain uh, clearly, that's why uh, when I was thinking about psychotic disorders, that means that people have impairments in their functioning that they are, themselves are disturbed by. And that's, that, that, that's how we define psychotic disorders. Thank you, we have another question there. Please be Hi. brief because we have a lot of people still I'll, wanting I'll to make questions. very brief. Uh, uh, Great presentation, Cole. Um, my name is Ricardo from uh, London. I'm a lawyer in this space, and we've seen massive changes in, in the space in the UK, but we've seen lack of patient access. What I'm just asking from your presentation, which was really, it was amazing in the sense that there's a misdiagnosis of data. Um, if we look at that um, misdiagnosis of data, where are you seeing that in the states of educational educational to those practitioners, professors, doctors in your space, understanding that there are benefits to cannabis, whether medicinal or adult use or whatever the case may be, as well as those um, individuals that don't take the cannabis, but accepting it that it should be allowed for those patients that need it. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, when I think about the education where what level or where do we aim our education? One of the things I try to do with our people like in science or medicine is I try and ask, I try and get people to understand that we don't want to lose credibility with the very people uh, for whom we care. So when you are crying wolf, as they say, uh, saying that something exists when people in the natural ecology who are engaged in this behavior don't see it, you lose credibility. And so I try to ask or help our people in science and clinicians to understand that they don't want to lose credibility and so uh, do not blindly, uncritically just err on the side of caution. You know, so if you, I err on the side of caution, some say, then I'm not promoting this behavior. Uh, but Simply doing that stupidly without thinking, 
but you lose credibility and you can't help the people that you claim to want to help. And so that's why uh, it requires us to always be thinking. Uh, and that's how I try to help people understand it. I, don't, I hope I'm uh, successful, but I, 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 it, the behavior, uh, the crying wolf behavior continues. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Yeah, I saw your hand, but I guess someone else was there. We will have time anyway after. Hello. Well, great honor, Dr. Collard, say hi to you in, in a moment, but yes. I have two, two pages to talk to you, man, so I'm going to just try to keep... Yeah, yeah, you keep it to a question? Okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. We, we have time. Uh, uh, we'll be, we, we can be here for the next hour. The one I'm more curious is about the, uh, the demographic of people here is more about on the medical and none of them kind of use so much on the recreational. And I kind of want you to break us down what would be that frontier because I don't see it so clear or that I don't see it a wall that big between what is the recreational use, which is a liberty in my belief, and the medical use, which is I think it's also a liberty and a responsibility for people to have access to. Uh, I have more questions about more beyond than the cannabis realm but I think the pattern still is the same, which is what is this frontier and how can we get, give this access responsibly? Because that is the price of that freedom. Thank you. Wow, um, that's a great question to end on. Um, the question is really asked, challenging us to think about, uh, uh, we think about being in medicine um, and then there are people who come seeking the help of medicine because they are in trouble. And, and so medicine tries to do what it can to help those folks, and that's a good thing. Yet there are other people who are uh, want to engage with these substances um, who don't need the help of medicine. Uh, and yet most of our governments around the world, including here, have somewhere in their constitutions that you as an individual have personal liberty. You have the right to in control your internal world. And so long as you don't prevent other people from doing the same. Uh, that's the proviso. Um, and, but there's a, con there's a contradiction. There is an inconsistency with, actu with actually delivering on that personal liberty. Uh, most governments don't deliver when it comes to substances. That's the that's the question. Um, yeah, it's a big question, and uh, uh, medicine does this thing, and it should continue to research these issues, help people who are in trouble, absolutely. But the liberty aspect of this is uh, we, we have fallen down as free societies in, liber in liberty in a number of ways. In fact, our sort of statements about liberty in our constitutions are nothing more than shams for a number of people in our society. Um, uh, and um, I mean, that's a fact. We can go down the list uh, when we think about how we have treated various individuals in our societies. People who um, have relationship with uh, people of the same sex. We treated their liberty poorly throughout history. Various racial groups, uh, various other marginalized groups. And so we can just we look, we go through the checklist, and our responsibilities as citizens is to make sure that our governments and we live up to our claims. Uh, but oftentimes, people have become blase about this and apathetic and agnostic, uh, and that's a problem. And I, I should end now because uh, uh, I think it's time for a break, right? I, I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor.